Okay, so we're back. Now here we are, chapter 15. In 15, we're going to talk about the boot process. What does it take for the computer to actually get up and running, get started? And if it's not starting the way that it's supposed to, what can we do about it? So, essentially, we've got two different types of startup. We've got old school boot process using the BIOS, B-I-O-S. And then we've got what I call the new school is UEFI. So we'll talk about those here in a little bit, but let's start first things first. And to start the computer up, well, you gotta press a button. You got a power button. And you may have a power button or switch back on the power supply in the back of the system, along with a power button on the front somewhere. And it depends on manufacturer where this is gonna exist. So first thing that we do is we push that button. And by pushing that button, we are telling the system I want to start this computer up. We are sending power to the things that need power to get up and going. So that power button can turn on the computer or it can restart the computer depending on how we're going about it. But let's look at it in this context. You push the button and it will start up the system. Now, we'll focus on, I don't want to deal with the reset button because all that's doing is saying, let's restart what's going on. We'll focus on starting. Okay. Now, starting itself, we've got two different kinds of systems, as I said. BIOS and UEFI. BIOS I refer to as old school. UEFI is the most recent type of ways to configure the boot process in a computer. So essentially, in the old school BIOS, we have data on the motherboard in a chipset on the motherboard itself that tells the computer step-by-step step how to get it up and running. It's information about the resources in the computer, where to go get the files we need, the MBR master boot record to get up and running. So I need to know where that is. And if that's on a piece of hardware, what kind of hardware is it? That information, old school BIOS lives and a chipset on the motherboard. Fast forward to the way things are coming out now. Now we're dealing with UEFI. We don't have all that data sitting on the motherboard. The data is actually on the hard drive somewhere. And the motherboard is smart enough to know how to go find it. And it doesn't need predefined pathways of here's exactly where you go find this every time. It has to be formatted this way. This is more flexible, more dynamic. And the system essentially says, well, let me go look and see what's over here. Oh, okay. There's a hard drive over here. Let me go in there, look and see if the stuff I need's in there. Oh, there it is. So it's more intuitive. It's more flexible. It's not as carved in stone as it used to be. We could say not as unforgiving as it used to be. But we still got rules that we've got to follow. There's software that we deal with in the BIOS that uses M the master boot record. And we've got the master boot record. It's the first sector 
and the hard disk. It's called a master boot record. Bias looks over there, finds it, but it knows where the hard drive is and what kind of hard drive it is to be able to do what it's going to do. We've got a system partition. That's an area of the hard disk reserved for system files. And we'll, we'll talk about that more moving forward. The boot manager is software that allows the system to access the boot configuration data to know. So the boot configuration data is, um, it's a file that's got information about how we're going to boot up, all the rules, where things are. It's, here's all the information we need. Well, we had to get in there before we could find um, the BCD, the boot configuration data. So essentially, we can't boot up without successfully navigating through all of these little components, steps along the way of BIOS or UAFI. So with that said, we've got all these little ins and outs, if you will, of what we've got to do to get through this. Now, either we're running BIOS or UEFI, we still have this logic when it comes to get the system up and running. Okay. So we start the post, say, was there an error? No. Okay, let's head this way. If there was, what was the error? Do we have video? And post is like, Let's look and see if the bare necessities are there just to start the boot. Okay. And if they're not, it'll send you a message. Whether it's beeps, might be an audible, could be a display message. Right. Let's assume there was no error. And now, there's a setting in the system itself in our boot configuration that tells the system, are we old school or new school? In a nutshell, are we using BIOS or UEFI? And you can't use both. Things have to be one way or the other. And you can't, I don't want to say, you, you should not try to switch back and forth because it's just, you're expecting problems if you do. You better expect problems if you do. So pick one and stick with it. Of the two, BIOS has been around longer. Of the two, UEFI is what's currently being adopted. Okay. So if we're using BIOS, it checks BIOS and it looks to see if it can find an OS. What OS are we going to run? What, what do we got going on? And from there, it looks at the master boot record, looks for the partition, loads boot manager, and reads the BCD to find out all the rules and parameters, everything it needs to know to start this process. So look at the BCD as the rules to the game. So if we went the other way, we went UEFI. It loads UEFI boot manager. It loads the drivers and says, let's get going. Make sure everything's secure. Follows the path, loads the boot file, and then reads BCD. So they're both similar, but different. The difference is where the data lives. One's in chipset, the other's in the hard disk. Now from there, doesn't matter which way, which path we got there, but we get to this point and now we've got to figure out 
what kind of boot is this going to be? Is this going to be a, a traditional startup, normal day-to-day -day stuff? Are we going to have a dual boot system to where it could be more than two, have multiple operating systems we can boot into? We've got different partitions, one for depending whatever type of operating system we're going to run. We could have Linux and Windows. There's a variety of things we could have set up, different versions of Windows. Or we can press F8 if it's available, and then it, that'll give us different ways to boot. We've got options we can pick. Or the system... had a problem last time, it recognizes there was a problem last time, and it jumps you straight into the recovery screen to try to fix whatever the issues are with boot. So if we're dealing with a traditional boot, normal startup, it loads bootloader, we load the kernel, hardware abstraction layer, we load the, the registry to know what's in there for the system itself. It reads the registry, the BIOS, reads everything that it needs. And then it starts memory paging process. At that point, it's up and running enough to switch it over to us still being in the startup to Look, we're far enough into startup that the operating system can take it from here. Now, that's a tradition. If we get a dual boot system, from here, they don't expand beyond what we would have here for this Windows Boot Manager screen. But if you've got a dual boot system, it'll take us to a Windows Boot Manager screen. And then from there, we may go over to a bootloader. We may go over to some other Linux, depending on the operating system. We don't know where we would go. It could be something like this. It could be something similar but different. We hit F8, we get the advanced boot option screen. You want to go into safe mode. You want to go into uh, a command line. How do you want to do it? And this one we already talked about. It's, it gives us a recovery screen to try to fix issues that may have existed. So, the operating system itself, We've got the OS and the kernel that talks to the Hardworks abstraction layer. And it reads more registry entries, builds what it needs to adhere to what's in the registry, starts different services, get its drivers going, and then it starts sessions got session session manager that gets up and going and has things that we don't necessarily think about it could be graphics um, it could be different things associated with the OS that it gets these things up and running and then from there they trigger other things whether it's the SSCM Services Control Manager um, starts that. Security author authority process could cause that to kick in. Uh, user initialization that says, all right, who, who, where, here's the policies associated with people. There's so many things that have to get up and running. And that's why I talked about in the last lecture if it says here's the bare minimum to run this OS, RAM, you want a whole, whole lot more because each of these little things that we've got going on is tying up RAM. They're working. They're tying up CPU. They're working. So we need more than just what the OS is going to use. OS has a lot of stuff going on. So we talked about POST, and that's a power on self-test. You hit the power button. Is the stuff we need to even get 
up and running? Is it available to us? Do we have a screen that somebody can interact with? We got a keyboard, we got some kind of inputs and software there. And it goes through and it does the test to see do we have everything that we need? Okay. We've got different options, and it could be there's no operating system. It's missing. I looked where it's supposed to be, and it's not there. Um, I couldn't load it. I tried to load it, and it failed. Uh, something about the partitions corrupted. There's a lot of things that could come into play. Now, I talked about that BCD that had all the rules, and things get changed over time. So the BCD has, has the rules in it. And depending on how we're going to load, do we need a traditional bootloader, or are we going into a dual boot? Which is it? Here's dual boot. Pick which one you want. You want Win 10 or Win 7? Okay. It had option number three. So when you dig deep to find how, what special ways to start up. And then we had, where's number four? Was, well, number four should have been recovery they got number three's recovery they've got an option missing and that's advanced boot I don't see that in here we'll see we may come up with it again in a little bit but that would be safe mode start up with a command line whatever it may be Okay, so we get to a certain point and they want our credentials. To get to this point, it has enough running to where user data is accessible to us and the drivers and everything are there for us to get the screen working right. Um, the OS is loaded to a point. And now it's going to allow us to interact with it. So what do you do when things don't go the way you plan them to go? App seems like a regularity for me. So if everything's normal, we can either fix the install, have a clean install, or I can go back to a previous version. So a variety of different things that we can do. We can repair, we can have the um, install disk and go fix things. Maybe Windows found there's a problem and it tries to help you, which may require that disk as well. But it goes through step by step and gives you options. Hey, you want to try this? You want to try that? <clears throat> it may take you to command line to minimize the amount of resources you're using so that will it run in, in a bare bones kind of system or do we even have that option? It may be able to run safe mode, not in command line. Uh, boot logging. These are all different things that I talked about that didn't come up in that other. This is our F8 key. Right. So we've got different ways to go about non-traditional startup. And if we created it from media, we do it from a, a media, we can do a clean install and come through and try and fix what's there. There was a problem before it's got a diagnostics and repair screen, which essentially takes you back to the same stuff. All right. So it's a lot of the same thing over and over again, different pathways to get to the same 
overall steps. We need to make sure that we have a backup available. Something happens, we got a, the ability to recover from. We turn on system restore and configured it to set restore points. We can cr capture a system image, which is a snapshot what the hard drive looked like, all the ones and zeros that make up the data. Snapshot in time, and then that image can be used to make things exactly what, the way they were before, like cloning the way everything was at that point in time. F8 allows us to go into that advanced boot that we talked about up above. We can do the same thing in a command line. Here's what it would look like to, once we're in it. And they give you different options. Safe mode, safe mode with access to the network, safe mode with a command prompt. Boot logging lets us know what's taking place so we've got a log of what worked, what didn't work. Minimize the resolution required for video, cut down on resources we're using. Try to debug along the way. Um, tell it, don't restart if it fails. Quit, that's like an endless loop. Um, let me get by without signature enforcement on the drivers. Maybe I can have a custom driver. Can you let me slide with a driver that's not a Microsoft official driver? Um, disable the early launch anti-malware driver. So if it recognizes, oh, we've got some malware, it may not actually be malware, but it's shutting you down early on. Or you just start up normal. Okay. And you just arrow down, hit enter, and you go. Now, we can, if we get into a command line, we can do these things in uh, a command line, but you have to understand that language, that, and it essentially is a programming language. Right. So one of the easiest things that we can do is to configure Windows recovery environment to where we've got a backup. We've got either a DVD, a USB, some kind of media, something stored to the cloud, something that will help us recover from bad things that happen. Like insurance. And the cost of that insurance is you taking the time to create these restore points the recovery, whatever it may be, how we're going about it. So if you haven't configured it, if you didn't create it, you don't have that resource there if something bad happens. I can set up a repair disk. Traditionally, this would work using that install disk or uh, the, what you used to create the system. It may be able to create one without it, but you, you create a DVD to help you um, be able to get back up and running should something happen. Okay, so we go create this recovery disk that'll help you get the system back up and going. It's got different boot files and whatnot to help you recover from bad things that have happened. You can have a recovery drive. It's a bootable thumb drive, or it could be a bootable drive doesn't necessarily have to be a thumb drive or a flash drive. It could be bigger, but it doesn't need to be big. Okay. Go into control panel and we just configure it and create it. That's a step-by-step -step process. Connect to the drive and configure the drive to be a recovery drive for you. Now, we can create a drive and it could be a DVD, it could be a flash drive, whatever we need using media creation tool and go and create something to help us recover that has the actual ISO on it. Great resource to have. And the ISO is what we use to do the initial install. That's from early on, module 11 and 12. 
Um, there are tools that we can use to help get through startup. First and foremost, it's that installation disk. Keep it. Keep copies of it in places that you know where they're at and you know they're not going to get damaged. They're clearly labeled when they were created, what they are. Having those, great resource. Beyond that, I can go into settings. It's an applet. Here it is here. And I can go create recovery. I mean, reset the PC. There's different options. And come down to back up my files. Depending on how I want to go about this, I need to make as many different types of backups as I can because one may not do everything I need to do. So we saw that screen where, say, it noticed that, hey, there was a problem last time, so we're not even going to try and start up. We're going to jump into this repair mode. And it'll take us somewhere like this. And if that didn't work, they'll give you the option to boot into some kind of recovery media. If you don't have it, you can't use it. You can't get in. So having it, huge. Now, having that recovery media, huge. There's different types of media we can have set up. Okay. And what it can do is different. It could help repair our startup, fix files that are corrupted, whatever it may be. And the operating system, as you were able to initiate the tools available to repair what's damaged and make it the way that it's supposed to be. Go through debug, find out what's going on. And hit F F2, enable boot logging and go through step by step the boot process. We had that low resolution safe mode. Safe mode runs the computer on the bare bones minimum resources available and says, let's try it. The example I used was run it without, run a car without the AC and the radio and everything. Let's see if everything will work fine without those. Oh look, every time you turn the air on, the engine shuts off, okay? Now we know where the problem or what's causing the problem. Let's find out why the problem exists. Safe mode with networking, I can jump in bare bones and connect resources over the network and utilize network resources to repair things and recover. I may want to do away with GUI altogether because that uses a lot of resources and just use command prompt. It may be that bad a problem. If it is, I need to know that language, and I've mentioned that before. Okay. We can initiate any of those files and run applets from a command line. We'll still have GUI, but it won't. We won't be using uh, a traditional desktop environment. We talked about these in previous screens. We'll just dig a little bit deeper into them. All right, so the system restore, depending on what's happened. Now, if you went in and you did something bad to the registry, it may not help to go restore things um, because of the registry. System restore traditionally won't help if the file system is corrupted or the registry is trashed. Um, command prompt, going to command line and fixing things that way and having files available on a thumb drive you can access and that could resolve what the issue is. But system restore is not the ultimate solution. It'll fix all our problems. 
Now, as we move through these modules, starting at the next module, 16, really start talking a lot about security. And the updates, we've got multiple kinds of updates. We've got application updates, we've got provider updates, provider meaning network, whoever who our ISP is, or who our mobile provider is, if we're connecting the network over to T-Mobile, or any other providers of Horizon, any of them. They may have an update particular to their service. We've also got updates coming from Microsoft relative to Windows. Primarily, those updates have to do with security of your system. Patches to protect you from the outside world. And Microsoft's notorious for releasing things that have not been fully vetted or that they know are not running at 100% or could cause problems. Their attitude many times in, in the past has been, eh, it'll be okay, what's the worst can happen? It's not our problem anyway, it's let the users deal with it. And we'll work on giving them a solution and we'll deal with that in the next update or the next whatever. I think about Windows 8, 8.1, 8.2. They were all Windows 8, it's just the first Windows 8 was broken when they released it. They knew it was broken and wasn't functional the way it should have been when they released it. But they said, you know what? We committed to it. Let's just go with it. We're going to release 8.1 in a little while, and that'll fix it. They released 8.1. That fixed some of it, but there's still problems. Oh, now we'll go to 8.2. So they're notorious for doing things that are not 100%, and the Windows updates are another one of those things that they're notorious for doing that have not been fully vetted that can potentially cause damage or problems. So let's say that you installed an update and now the system ain't working right. We can go into the advanced option screen, go in and uninstall an update. Let's undo what we did because whatever that update was, now my system doesn't work. So we've got a way to undo that. We've got a way to recover from a system image. We've got a way to run a command prompt to go find out what's going on. Try to repair the startup. Now, the command prompt window in the recovery environment. We're in the system 32 file, which is the operating system. And we can navigate to other places, but traditionally they're going to expect us to want to run something in here because those are the operating system files. Now, I may need to repair the hard drive, something about it, the file system, um, what, whatever it may be, I can do these things in a command line. But I, like I said before, you need to know that language. I'm not digging into that in this course. We're at a higher level than that. We're not digging that deep into it. But there's different commands, there's descriptions, and this is, you can essentially take an entire course on getting familiar with command line. I deal with PowerShell a lot in the server classes. It's another version of Windows command line interface, but it's more focused on server management and not client system management. So. If we want to reinstall Windows, and we've got that original disk we used to do this install, and I can piggyback off of that and fix 
my install, there's there's an option, and that's different versions. I can go back to a previous version of what I got going on and do a system restore if I have a restore point. There's a variety of different ways of going about it. I can do a reset. Um, I can say, you know what? It didn't work. Let's do a clean install on it. We'll try again. There's an option. Right. So we've got a bunch of different options on how to go about repairing it. And if we're going to repair it, um, I've got tools that I can use to help. I talked about that ISO. There's places to go help find files. If we have the media, we can go about it. But like I said, create copies of it and store them so you have that ISO somewhere. It's not something you can store on the system itself. It's an external location, thumb drive. Uh, DVD may or may not hold that kind of information, depending on how what operating system it is. Um, if we're talking about client system, DVD. If we're talking about a server, a DVD won't hold it so much anymore. You need to be on a thumb drive. Now, if we want to do this recovery and try and fix what took place, how are we gonna? How much repairing are we going to do? We're gonna start fresh. Do you need to keep any files or personal information, can, or can we start fresh? Which is it? And we need to answer those questions as we go along. I'm gonna go ahead and fix Win 10, keep the files that I've got, the applications I got, and let's go get this thing going again. So you're reinstalling but not necessarily like starting with a clean slate. You're still carrying over some of the stuff you already have. You're just overwriting the Windows files along the way, not the applications and your personal stuff. The image, I mentioned that that's like taking a snapshot of the hard drive at any given point in time. The, part, the hard drive is made up of ones and zeros little switches that are turned on or off. And the combination of those ones and zeros are interpreted into what this computer is and what it can do. So if we took a snapshot of the hard drive of how all the ones and zeros are laid out and then cloned another hard drive with that exact image, we've cloned the system. There's software that allows us to do it, and uh, that's a great way to go about recovering things. Now, I could have a recovery partition, and it's a partition on the hard drive that has everything we need to be able to recover the data. But the problem is, if that partition becomes corrupted or the hard drive is the problem, we're out. So it goes back to that same thing about having a backup. The backup can't exist in a place that could potentially be compromised. And if the hard drive is what could potentially be compromised, that's not where I want to put my backup. We do it because it's quick and easy, and maybe that'll work. Doesn't take that much space scheme of things but it's an option okay I can go through and do a reset keep your files or not I want to keep my files and keep everything the way the factory was application wise I want everything just to be the way it was from scratch. No files, get rid of all the applications, and then go through and just load the stuff that came with the system. 
Okay, so we've got the three options that we can go through, and it's they're pretty straightforward. And along the way, as we go to reset it, it will ask us the questions. How do you want to do it? Now, are the resources that I need, are they on the cloud? Are they local files? I've got to have those resources available. And then I go from there. And it'll walk me through it step by step. As long as I have the resources available to do what I need to do, I'm fine. Right. So the biggest thing is identifying what the problem is. And once I know what the problem is, what's it going to take to fix it? Is it going to be a significant repair or is it going to be a minor repair? I need to know how long it's going to take, what resources are going to be required for me to effectively make this happen. Test it, see if what I tried actually did work and the problem's gone and make sure that it worked, verify everything's working, and then document everything. Now, our hard drive has a lot of stuff on it. And I've got a SATA to USB converter. That I just actually had it in class yesterday in my 1150 class and had discussion about it and if something bad happens I can pull my drive out plug it into this SATA adapter and plug it in another system if something bad happens I can buy another hard drive plug it into that adapter plug that adapter into my system, get my files out. There's a variety of different things I can do. Here's an example of a USB to SATA converter. This was a little different than mine. Mine's got power and data on it, and this one's just data. Here's the power. So mine's all in one. I don't have an external coming off the wall power. But they're they're different. They're not all created the same. Now we hit this before we talked about different kind of messages that would come up on the boot. There's another thing that we may see. It's not going to be a black screen. It could be a blue screen. Sometimes they call it the blue screen of death. But essentially, much like we see here, it says it went looking for the OS and we couldn't find it. We went looking for the boot drive or the boot device and we couldn't find it. Whatever it may be. I went looking for something. I couldn't find it. That's essentially what the blue screen is in a way that application went looking for something or the OS went looking for something in its day-to-day -day tasks and what it was looking for was something really important and either it wasn't there or it's corrupted either one it, it, but it doesn't matter because it's something that it has to have and if it doesn't it says we're done here game over we're shutting down without that I'm done Kind of like the AC broke in the office. All right, we're done. Not working today. No AC. I'm not. I'm not sitting in this building with no AC. Oh, no AC and no lights. We're absolutely done. So, um, what do we do when we get these messages? Well. I can try that cable that we were talking about before, that adapter, pull the drive and see 
is there something in there. I can pull the drive out, connect the drive to another system, and run a disk check on it, find out is, is the disk corrupt? What's going on? Could be a cable, something's happened. There's a variety of different things. It could be that somebody went and switched me over from BIOS to UEFI. I've seen this happen. Very aggravating. If your system runs BIOS and somebody went into the settings and changed it to UEFI, all the information you need is in BIOS, not UEFI, or vice versa. You're running UEFI and somebody switched you over to BIOS. Well, there is no information in the BIOS. So it's, like I said, you can't switch back and forth in there. Sometimes you can go try and do a restore. Maybe that'll help. Could be a partition issue. We just don't know. It's just a matter of going through step-by-step -step methodically trying to find where is the issue? What, what caused, what's causing it? This is last resort. Like I said, avoid the registry unless you're deep into this game and you know it. Okay. It's not something we want to go play with. Right. It could be a user profile that's corrupted. We go delete the user profile and recreate it. It could be where the problem is. Um, I talked about the blue screen. Traditionally, it's something's damaged or missing. And all too often, it's that the analogy I used it two kids fighting over a toy. That's it. One kid broke the toy. Blue screen. And that's like the computer screaming. My toy's broken. Um, we've got all kinds of logs that keep track of what took place. And we can scan through the logs to find out where the issues are, what took place. Um, sometimes we could have issues with drivers. Um, but it's not a common thing because the drivers we have have been certified, they're authorized by Microsoft. If we're dealing with Microsoft OS, as long as <coughs> those drivers are official Microsoft drivers that have been tested and they're supposed to work with this OS, should not have a problem. <coughs> it's not to say somebody didn't go through and install another driver that is not a valid driver. <coughs> it happens. People do crazy things. So we just got to find out that the driver is correct. Okay, so it could be a hard drive problem that's causing a system to shut down every now and then, or that not shutting things down could cause problems on the startup. So I, I've got an analogy I commonly use about a refrigerator. And just talking in class about this yesterday. So a refrigerator, when you open the refrigerator, you have an expectation that it's going to look inside the way it did when you last accessed it and closed the doors. Assume you're the only one interacting with this refrigerator. So last time you were in there, you left things the way you want them. You closed the doors. The next time you go into the refrigerator, you open the doors, you have an expectation that things will be a certain way. Now, what if something happened while you were making a sandwich? You had stuff out of the refrigerator, you're making a sandwich, and then all of a sudden there's a car accident outside. 
and you don't put things away the way they're supposed to be put away. Things got left out on the counter. That's the same as not shutting down the computer properly. Those things that got left out on the counter may not be viable to use moving forward. We may need new versions of them. They have to open a new jar of mayonnaise because that one, uh, it's been sitting out for three hours, whatever it may be. So if we go through this methodical step-by-step -step <coughs> process of shutting down the computer, things are supposed to be the way we expect them when the time comes to start up. But we don't always have the luxury of things shutting down the way we want them to. Whether it's a power issue, you just never know what it is that's going to cause this computer to have to stop. <coughs> Excuse me. I apologize for this cough. It's just really come over me now. So, this module is troubleshooting the startup itself. It just didn't start up the way it should have. We move forward into the next module. We're going to get into 16, like I said, security. And then we've got more security. And then we've got more security. And then we've got more security. We've been talking about security already to a degree, but we're going to talk about a lot of security moving forward. And I'll see you in the next module.